Welcome to the Be Well at USAS podcast. My name is Peter Headley. In each episode, members of the USASC and wider community will join me to share ideas and provide guidance on all aspects of being well. And we'll be highlighting initiatives and resources designed to engage and support you. In these challenging times, we hope the ideas and information we share will help. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Regan Mandrick, who is a professor of computer science at the University of Saskatchewan. Her work is at the international forefront of research studying human-computer interaction. Within the context of video games, her work explores the novel ways of understanding players and their experiences. She also develops and evaluates games for preventing, assessing and treating mental health and games that foster interpersonal relationships. We're going to be talking about the ways in which video games can contribute to social connection and positive mental health. Well, welcome to the podcast, Regan. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So can you start off telling me about your background and the work that you do at the university? Sure. I'm a professor in computer science, but my specific area that I work in is called human-computer interaction. And it's really where the idea of computers meets the idea of people. And so it's kind of what I call the touchy-feely side of computer science. So we have to understand systems, but we also need to understand the people that use them. Um, And so it's very interdisciplinary. So I know early in your academic career, I understand you avoided using the term video games in your journal and conference submissions. Um, Why was that? And, And do you think that's changed now? It wasn't so much that I avoided using the term video games. It's just that it was always an example of something. I never wrote a paper or a grant that was motivated by the use of video games, but it was always an example of something else, Um, simulations or uh, some other thing. And I think it was at the time, it was just seen as something playful and not so serious and so maybe not worthy of research. But that changed over time because games, well, they're serious business. It's a huge industry in Canada. It's, uh, we're the third largest, pro- well, we were the third largest producer of video games until China took over our third spot. Um, but it makes more money uh, than music and movies combined. Uh, it's the leisure act of a, activity of choice for a lot of people out there. And uh, consumers are spending a lot of time and money on video games. So at some point... In the last 10 years, I realized that the narrative had changed, that I was writing papers and grants that were motivated by understanding players and their experiences. So around this idea of of players' experiences, I know a lot of your work focuses on this idea of wellness or the underlying foundation of social connection. To what extent does the online world um, and and video games in particular help you to maintain connections and, and positive mental health, I'm particularly thinking at the moment? Yeah, this idea of games as things that connect people socially has always been kind of a part of my work. Uh, Games have always been a big part of my family, not video games, but board games and card games. Um, We might not always agree on conversation topics like politics and or religion. And so if we try to talk about those kinds of things, it might end badly for us. So we ended up doing a lot of um, game playing. We play we played a lot of board games growing up. And so and that helped us connect to each other. So I think I carried that experience into my own work that I started doing on um, games as a way to form and maintain social connections, which is the subject of my current um, NSERC Discovery Grant. And it's really important in general. I mean, social connection is key. It's, it's you know, when people feel socially ostracized, um, there are measurable and harmful effects on how they interpret the world around them. Ambiguous information becomes interpreted as hostile. The world basically becomes a darker and more threatening place. Recent studies have even shown that um, people who feel socially isolated have a 30% increase in risk of mortality. So basically, isolation and rejection are really harmful because they thwart our fundamental need to belong. And games and play have been historically an important part of combating this social isolation from dice games and tile games through board games and card games and now digital games. They've long provided us with a way to interact with others, connect with others, form and maintain relationships. And, and, you know, I recently um, just just before actually uh, we went through this period of social isolation, I, I taught my two older sons to play chess. Um, something that I'd learned when I was young, mainly on the basis for, for a lot of the things you're describing, but also the attributes around uh, the lessons for their personal development around focus and self-management strategy. But they also play a lot of video games. And I guess I've never really thought that those video games might be doing exactly the same things for my sons. Um, am I wrong about that? Is, are the video game, have the video games already taught them those things? 
Research has shown in our lab and uh, other labs around the world that video games actually are providing a lot of cognitive benefits. Not all video games, but certain aspects of video games. Um, in particular, action video games. These are games like your first-person shooters or platformers that have a lot of kind of um, things in them that are kind of pulling your attention and demanding your focus. These have been shown to really improve uh, aspects of our cognition and games teaching people strategies and tactics. Uh, and we're really starting to kind of unpack which games are providing a lot of these kinds of value, like the kind that you mentioned about your sons, and which games are more about just kind of a pleasurable pastime. Another thing that, that games provide, video games provide, that are um, that's a really important part of kind of maturing and growing as a person is this idea of managing failure. So games are all built around this repeated failure. There's something that um, Jesper Yule calls the paradox of failure. That's that, you know, we don't like failing. Video games make you fail. We're drawn to something that we know we're going to experience failure in. Um, and we do this. We, we try over and over again to beat a boss, to, to, to beat a level. Uh, we, re we return to a game that provides a lot of frustration in that failure. Um, and we've been doing work on how that failure actually for a lot of players is really just seen as something along the path to success. And so it really does, video games are teaching not only things like um, focused attention and strategy and tactics, like you mentioned, but also how we, you know, how we deal with failure, how we step up in the face of repeated failure and try again. And I guess this is speaking, um, you know, into the area of work that I do around the notion of resilience. It's interesting. I, I was listening, listening to you talk. Uh, and the thing that I've said to my sons at the end of games is it's not about winning or losing. It's about learning, um, which which has been quite a helpful framing. But is is that what it is then, this idea that there is another stage to move up to again and again, particularly I'm thinking of the old platform games and getting to the end. But there's another level. Um, is is that what's being learned in, in this exercise in a way that perhaps isn't being recognized? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, since the coin-operated arcade games of the 70s and 80s, we've kind of seen this, like, there's another chance, there's another level, um, there's a chance to do a level faster, better, with fewer errors. Um, and those kinds of repeated efforts are not really seen, I think, in a lot of other contexts and do provide a lot of these benefits that, that you mentioned. I'm not sure there's been... I can't think of any work off the top of my head that's really connected it to kind of resilience or growth mindset or some of these other kinds of um, ideas pulling from psychology. But I, I do think that that's a big part, this idea of how we deal with failure and how we learn through that failure is really inherent uh, and has been throughout the history of digital gaming. And I guess maybe thinking about it more, um, perhaps what I really mean is the idea of perseverance. You know, a lot of the criticisms, mm. particularly of millennials, is that they don't have this. Um, and I'm... I'm not sure that I've ever thought that's actually true, um, but um, just that notion of young people working through difficulties and persevering, which is one of the critical pieces around mental health. Yeah, I think that um, in the, if we look at the way that people behave in video games, we would not really see that. People do persevere um, of all ages and uh, through through uh, challenges that seem really insurmountable or also, I guess, to some people that would seem kind of trivial. Like, what, what is the point of trying to do that speed run in that amount of time? Is there any real benefit to that? But yet people try over and over again uh, to do that. So I think when, when there's something that they're motivated to do, when it's something that they care about that's kind of important to them, then we do see this in video games where we see this kind of perseverance throughout. So if you say to people, and I'm particularly thinking of parents of young people nowadays, that video games benefit neurological development, you presumably encounter a lot of doubters and very few supporters. But that seems to be what your research is indicating. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, this idea that uh, that parents might have of video games being being evil or being the source of something that's going to you know fry their kids' brains. Um, there's a really interesting book written by Chris Ferguson called Moral Combat, uh, which I think is a very clever clever title. Uh, and it really talks about the moral panic surrounding video games and kind of goes through the history of how this has happened with other technologies. And, and the key factor being technologies that are unfamiliar to an older generation, but widely adopted and, and sought out by a younger generation. So this has happened with comics and with TV. And there's always kind of this idea of moral panic around them. And the same is true of digital games, but the research is not supporting that. Um, the research results are showing that certain types of video games, in particular action video games, um, are very good at promoting cognitive benefits. They help um, increase attention capacity, uh, focused attention, executive function. They have cognitive benefits in terms of reading for children, um, in terms of 
preventing age-related cognitive decline in older adults, and uh, a lot of benefits for people, all the people in between. And presumably research is also looking at that, the value of that social connection piece that it's also providing. Yeah, that's uh, really a big focus of my work is really looking at how games can help us to form new relationships, how they help us to maintain existing ones, um, how we can actually uh, um, support people who have very different interests or abilities to play together in the same game. So like, uh, for example, parents playing with young grandchildren who may not have um uh, as develop skills as them, or me playing with my 10-year-old son who's so much better at Fortnite than me, uh, how we can actually do these kinds of activities together. And we find some really interesting results, um, you know, down to the idea that uh, that the, the relationships that people have through online play have been shown to be as meaningful to them as ones that they have in the physical world and have actually been shown to help combat loneliness and I'm also aware um, of the application of games with mood repair. Can can you explain what that term means and what that looks like in practice? Sure. Um, mood repair is really something that refers to how we use games to help us repair noxious moods. Um, and it does this in a number of ways. A, a good example is if we're feeling very stressed, um, we might play a game that kind of brings us down, that uh, relaxes us. And if we're feeling very bored, we might play a game that kind of challenges us, that brings us up. And that's the idea of arousal equilibrium. The same is true of um, games that help take us from very negative moods into more of a positive state. Uh, they're very good at repairing um, noxious moods when they provide us kind of these pleasurable um, or hedonic experiences, but they also have been shown to provide us very um, meaningful or eudaimonic experiences where people who are suffering uh, from something more chronic or are going through a bereavement or a breakup or some other kind of loss have used video games to help transition them um, through a time that's been very challenging to them. I guess it also makes me think of people making music playlists and the, you know, the cognitive value of something like music therapy. Is, is there any kind of alignment in terms of what, what's happening here with games? Yeah, I think it's the same underlying theories, um, the same theories of mood management that have applied to other forms of media, to TV, to music, to books, um, to the kind of fiction that we might immerse ourselves in, uh, have been applied to video games in exactly the same way. And people have found that it's a little bit different sometimes because video games are interactive, uh, where a lot of those other forms of media are more focused on passive consumption. But the key theories that are kind of guiding why we're choosing, like it's called selective exposure, why we're choosing using the media that we're choosing at a particular moment in time and how that helps us self-manage our mood and kind of like in a in a self-care sort of way is, is really true of video games too. The difference being that sometimes um, if you're in the middle of a season of a, a, a Netflix season of a certain show, but you're finding maybe it's too stressful to watch at this moment and I want something a little more calming, you know, I might be in the middle of, um, I was in the middle of watching Homeland uh, when all this, uh, when all this COVID stuff happened and I started, you know, I just, I just switched to British Bake Off. I mean, that was what I needed at the, the, at that mm -hmm. moment. Uh, well, when that I makes was sense. Kind of to come down. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's happened in our household too. <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of, that's, that's an, a, a good example of how we might uh, use media to help regulate our mood. Um, and with games, it's a little bit different sometimes because people don't necessarily always switch games. They've kind of invested a lot into a game, but they might switch the way that they play the game. That's something that we're finding in our current research right now. Um, so in a game like Fortnite even, or Minecraft, you know, you have lots of different modes of playing. You can play in a very competitive mode, you can play solo, you can play teams, you can play in a creative mode, and people might kind of switch what mode they're playing and based on their mood. And so particularly thinking about this current situation, one of the major issues being experienced um, locally and globally is, is, is around the issue of uncertainty and the loss of control. In what ways does your work tell you that gaming can help in, in these conditions? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really fascinating right now. Um, we've done a lot of work in the lab on stress and recovering from stress. That's a really big focus of, of uh our research program in my group. And stress has two main components, uh, according to a lot of the research. The first is ego involvement, and that's basically that a person is invested in something. Um, the second is a sense of uncontrollability. And this could be a task that's too difficult, a future that's uncertain, or just some kind of sense that you don't have control over the world around you. And we, in the lab, we manipulate this sense of uncontrollability to induce stress in people. But right now, it's like the whole world is a giant stress induction for people. We have no control what's going on. Um, it's very uncertain, you know, what's going to happen over the next 12 to 
you know, 24 months uh, or longer. And, and so that's kind of a big part. And we also know um, from research, from previous research, things that help us recover from acute stress. And there are four main things that help us recover. Psychological detachment from what's going on around us, a feeling of um, relaxation, feeling the uh, chance to experience mastery over challenges that are set for you and feeling like you have a little bit of control in your environment. So anyone who's a gamer would think of those four things and think, oh yeah, games actually do a really good job of providing not just one or two, but all four of those things. So our work has been showing that they're very good at helping us recover from stress. Um, we were manipulating that in the laboratory, but but now um, we're unable to do that because we're all socially isolating. So it's it's a, a very timely issue that we've been looking at. And so even as I'm talking to you, I have two of my children just around the corner from <laughs> me um, who are playing Lego. And there's a part of me that says, oh, well, Lego good, video games bad. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us right now with young children um, trying to have them have some level of education or positive stimulation, um, there's definitely a challenge. What what would you say to parents who are concerned about children overloading on screen time and, and maybe worrying about the damage it's causing, uh, particularly because there's more hours now than, than there would have ordinarily been? Yeah, I think these are really valid concerns. Um, there's not really a good answer in terms of the number of hours a day. I don't think that's something that we can really answer very easily right now. But I think the way to think about it is um, in terms of what value they're getting out of their screen time. And so screen time isn't isn't kind of an, an all, all you know, one size fits all thing. It's not a monolith. Uh, you know, we don't talk about food time, for example. We know that some foods are good for us. Some foods are good for us in moderation. Some foods we only enjoy at Christmas or birthdays. Um, but we don't talk about kind of food time in general. And the same is true of screens. And so not all screen time is created equal. And so what value are kids getting from it? Are they coming out of that screen time feeling restored, feeling able to tackle other challenges around them, feeling prepared to tackle their homework or, um, you know, or to socialize with other people? Or are they coming out of that frustrated? Are they angry? Are they starting to get to the point of rage quitting their game? Um, that's something to be looking for, kind of the value that they're getting out of it. And I think that... Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about that is that gaming really exists on a spectrum. It starts at, you know, this healthy gaming, the kind of stuff that I'm that I'm studying, the benefits where it's helping us recover from stress and repair moods, um, through to problematic gaming and all the way through to gaming disorder. So there's a whole spectrum of gaming. Um, and, you know, the same game that provides all these benefits that I've been talking about can also cause a lot of harm to a different player or even to the same player under a different context. And we're really trying to tease that out. That's really what my research program is about, is trying to tease out when games are providing healthy social connections versus when are they displacing you know, healthy offline social connections? When are games providing a healthy source of a leisure activity for recovery versus when are they actually being used in a pathological way that kind of prevents people from doing other activities? I think um, the real thing for parents to think about is, is there a balance? Are they playing games as part of kind of a range of activities that also includes exercise, fresh air, socializing with others, non-digital leisure activities? Um, but yeah, I, I, even though I study this for a living, I also still have that idea, you know, that like Lego good, gaming bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm reassured it's not just me. So... I mean, you were talking about sort of when things are healthier, um, but often not. And a lot of what we do hear about, and, you know, I think even in, in my own experience at home, is experiencing some of those, I guess, what I call toxic behaviors in an online context. And and I say that as a father of sons, knowing that if I had daughters, I would be even more concerned. What, what have your observations been about these types of behaviors and, and the potential impact upon, um, well, everyone, not just young people? Yeah, toxicity in online gaming scenarios is a huge problem. Um, it's something that we're working on, and it's something that gaming companies actually really care about. Because if they release games that fuel toxicity, um, then they then they in, end up losing players. They lose a huge segment of the population um, if if women just don't or girls choose not to play their games. Um, and then they lose money in the end. So gaming companies not only want to provide more benevolent play environments because it's better for people, but they also want to do it because it's their business to have subscribers. Um, and toxicity, like you mentioned, really often takes the form of slurs, slurs that are um, grounded in race or gender. And uh, actually, one of my PhD students has been looking at the experience of discrimination in games for marginalized players. Um, and actually, just last week, um, my postdoc and several of my 
other PhD students and I, we published a paper on how we can actually sense the quality of social interactions in online play using unobtrusive sensors. So things that are just uh, naturally available to us that we can actually just pick up using um, software, not hardware sensors. Um, and so it's a first step, but we were able to predict the affiliation between two players, so a dyad, um, with 80% accuracy. And it's this kind of computational modeling that helps us get to the point where maybe we can predict toxicity kind of as it's developing before it happens, before it's harmful, and then find ways in the game to prevent that uh, or the game community to prevent that from happening because it is a really big problem. Um, in terms of practical advice, though, for parents who might be uh, worried about this, I think there are lots of ways that we can, you know, get that social quality um, from online gaming without being exposed to that. You can play with people that you know um, rather than in an open world. There are also moderated Minecraft servers for kids that will ensure their safety in larger scale online interactions. Um, and I think this is part of why educating parents educating themselves about their kids' interests and not being afraid of the unfamiliarity of a digital online digital gaming is really important to ensure their safety. Well, I think, yeah, it's often that balance between fear and disinterest, which is uh, I'm just, I don't want to hear about it. It's, I mean, so, I mean, in terms of what you're describing, it's, um, it's one of those interesting things for me about the understanding of what's happening. When I listen to my son talking about him and his friends roasting one another, hmm. and I think, no, I think it just actually mean abuse, you know, so actually <laughs> it's often the framing of it. So it's a gag, it's a joke. And the question being, you know, that we sit down and talk about, well, for everyone, is it a joke? So I think, you know, that's that's also one of the pieces that also um, aligns with some of the work that we do at the university around sexual violence uh, prevention, even just understanding what we mean when we talk about this notion of toxic masculinity, a phrase that I know not everybody particularly appreciates and it doesn't bring everyone to the table. But for sure, I you know, that certainly is uh, more what I think of when I hear you describing that behavior online. Well, and I think it's um, it's not really a question, but I really do think that gaming is a good, just like gaming was a way for me to explore concepts in my early research that were fairly low risk. I think gaming is an opportunity for kids to actually start to learn some of these lessons in a way that's a little uh, lower risk to them. So people, kids often learn this, I think, through team sports. This is something that's happened in the past where they learn to be a supportive teammate, a gracious loser, a good competitor. Um, to be very competitive um, without being a jerk, you know, this kinds of things. And gaming actually also provides a lot of those opportunities to learn how to become um, like a strong competitor, a good ally, uh, to to handle people that might come at you with um, with to like toxic slurs and to try and figure out how one deals with that. It's a it's an interesting, you know, exposing children that are too young to that sort of behavior is obviously not going to be helpful. But I also think that there's an opportunity here um, to use games to help educate kids about these kinds of behaviors that are maybe I hate to use the word appropriate because that sounds like it's a it sounds like it's it's something that's kind of like, you know, you're controlling somebody with an idea of what's appropriate and not appropriate. But maybe the better word is harmful. You know, what's harmful to others versus what's actually helpful to others. Maybe it's worth balancing things up because I shared a story with you that I've seen over the weekend um, was a parent um, really expressing pride in her 15 year old son. And he and his friends had come uh, were playing online and they'd come across a gamer and um, and sort of picked him up and they were playing and, and soon realized that he was actually just 10 years old, so much younger. Um, and realized that it was his birthday um, the next day and that he was had spent the, you know spent the evening alone. He was going to spend his birthday alone. And basically uh, arranged for an amazing day for him to play all these games and to give him all of the things that they'd won and and really just a celebratory uh, expression to a complete stranger. Uh, it just seemed to be such a great example of the stories that that we often don't hear, particularly about young boys. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's, I love that story. It's a great story, and it's something um, like you said. You know, without getting into too much about the the stereotypical gamer, because I actually reject those notions that there is a stereotype of a gamer. Um, research has kind of shown otherwise, uh, but that idea, in particular, it is a, a hobby that does attract a lot of a lot of boys, a lot of young boys, and um, it's interesting. I've been doing a little bit of work on masculine beliefs and how that plays into um, our identities as gamers and how that actually plays into our genre choices and and kind of gets borne out. It's it's preliminary work. We're still working on it. Um, 
but it, it 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 stays with people for a really long time. We're also doing work on on pinball actually, uh, and pinball is a is a very interesting. It's not a digital. Well, it actually is a digital game. There are digital components to it, but it's a very interesting game that's been around for a long time, um, primarily played by men, uh, but in a very social space. Um, and so we're looking at kind of the social value that people are getting that might not be kind of seen, you might not think about it off the top of your head. You might not think pinballs providing, uh, you know, men with any kind of value, but we're actually showing otherwise that men who might not be what, willing to talk about their mental health um, are doing so over a game of pinball, that there's something about standing side by side, shoulder to shoulder with somebody that allows men to open up a little more about these kinds of things than, you know, the face to face, the way we think about in, in you know, a therapeutic context, for example, um, that allows men and to kind of express some of the things that they're feeling. Uh, and, and so it's a very interesting, I think, space to be looking at the opportunities it affords and not just the harm that may result because it's here, gaming is here, it's here to stay. And so why not spend some time trying to optimize it so that you know it can do good for us as people and um, rather than just thinking about the ways it might harm us. Yeah, it makes me think, actually, I took my son, uh, or my um, son number two, fairly recently to a pinball place, which is just in South Katoon of Idlewild. And we had a great, we had a great time and we had lots of conversations. And, and then there's a Star Wars pinball game we have, I think probably on the, on the Wii U or something like that. Uh, and I thought, well, how, how does that work? Like, I can't see, it just feels like such a physical social experience. And so I think Yeah, I don't think it translates the... well to the consoles. <laughs> no. Oh, well, good. I, I'm reassured, but. Yeah. I just meant so, that there are lights that the lights that light up telling yeah. you what to do in the game. It's it's digital. It's an animal. It's definitely a tactile game, though. Yeah. Yeah, I like, but I like that idea of creating social context through games, whether that's in person or online. So, um, as a parent, if I was wondering if a game is appropriate uh, for my six-year-old or my eight-year-old or my eleven-year-old, is there any guide for me to know the answer to that question? Yeah, I think that uh, it's interesting because a lot of people don't know that the games actually have a rating system very similar to movies. Um, and so you can look it up online and see if that game is appropriate for the child of that age. You know, a great example is like people think that all first person shooters are, you know, violent, bloody, gory games. But yet Fortnite is really designed for children um, to be playing. And so how do you kind of reconcile that? But if you look at the ratings, you'll see um, you'll see why. And so I think it's important to take a look to make sure that kids are playing things that are that really are age appropriate for them. So yep. when a slightly different um, uh, angle, I, so when I was preparing for our conversation, I read a recent uh, interview in the Star Phoenix, which you gave. And even before I started reading, the, the article header told me that it was a, quote, two minute read. What, what does that say about what might be happening to our concentration spans when they actually need to tell us these things on a platform, which would then determine if it was a four minute read that, that I'm not reading it? I have done that. I mean, I like see an interesting medium article reference from a tweet and then I open it and it says eight minute read and I'm like, oh, hell no. And so I'll just look at the TLDR at the beginning. Um, we're getting used to this like consumption and bite sized snacks. I mean, if you look at kind of the media platforms that are that are arising even now, like TikTok over the last several years, really short form or even um, Quibi. It's like, I don't know if you use that. It's a it's it's television for your phone. It's very recent um, and it's all very short form. Uh, and it's produced. It's produced television with celebrity actors and whatnot in a format that's uh, optimized for your phone, but it's all short form. Um, and it's interesting because you'd, you'd think that all of our attention kind of is is uh, is being driven into these very bite-sized formats. And that might be true, but games are a very interesting counterpoint to that, though. Like, I have never heard someone express uh, worry that their kids aren't paying enough attention to games or are unwilling to sit through them for a particular amount of time. Um, yeah, we do have a lot of games now that are available to us on our tablets and smartphones that are really kind of designed to be played in little small chunks and little two to ten minute bursts of time. They even use things like cool down timers to prevent overplay um, to try and... Um, you know, we, we actually published a paper on this last year called uh, that talked about snacking patterns of gaming. So when you go to the game frequently and you snack on it rather than sitting down and kind of feasting um, on your gameplay. And so that is a thing that exists now in games, but the feast is still there. I mean, people will still sit down and get sucked in and play for hours. Um, and so it's a very interesting counterpoint, I think, to that attentional argument that it's it's kind of happening at a generational shift. I, I even think of the idea of novels or, um, you know, audio books to say that oh, this is going to be 12 and a half hours of your life and people just go, no, I, I just don't, I, I can't dedicate more than 37 minutes to something like this. So, I, you know, we've I never, we've never done it. that with literature, have we? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I actually did open my kids up to audiobooks during this whole COVID situation and uh, never really have before except on road trips. And I've been, I've meant to, but it's always seemed to be hard to fit in. Um, and we just finished one that was 16 hours or something. Um, and they were just begging for the next one. And, and just, you know, we just kind of had a, ha- and I just can't even believe it's so, it's so odd. I can't even believe um, that they were willing to do that. That was some, not something I expected. So yep, I think it's well, still there inside of us. I think mm-hmm. all that, you know, ability to focus uh, our attention is still there inside of us. <laughs> yeah, well, I was about to say, I'm very proud to say that uh, my eldest son is upstairs reading a Hunger Games book right now. So. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So paper, just, even. Well, yeah, I know. I know. I on that. paper. So um, just in a slightly different um, direction, talking about the idea of mental health, um, the tech industry's fairly recently recognized that the mental health space is an area with enormous potential and, and particularly financial, which has led to the development of an assortment of mental health and wellness apps. Where, where do you see we're at with this type of technology at present and, and how helpful do you feel they really are? Yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because uh, if you go to the App Store or Google Play Store and you search for, um, you know, mental health app or even like something like CBT for, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, you'll see literally hundreds of apps claiming mental health benefits. Um, But in terms of the research on this, even though many of these apps actually work in lab environments and in in RCTs as well, um, research has basically shown that they're not really working very well in the wilds for the most part. And the idea from that is that basically people just don't use them. Uh, so something that might work in an RCT when someone is a participant in an experiment and they're being assigned to this condition and so they use the app every day, um, that actually works quite well. But when they're actually, you know, when it's a self-help situation and they're just having to, you know, do it under their own volition, um, they're actually just not completing the modules. Even the best exercise program won't work unless you actually do it. Um, I had a PhD student that just uh, that graduated about two years ago whose work was on taking, harnessing some of that motivational pull that we have from games and thinking about how we can actually bring that in um, to digital health services so that we can um, encourage people to be kind of more intrinsically motivated to use them and not extrinsically motivated to use them. The bigger problem, though, that I see with these apps other than this is that most of the digital interventions that are out there are digitizations of what works in traditional approaches. So the idea is to take something that works in a therapeutic context and digitize it. Um, And that's probably not going to be the most effective solution because there are things that we're not controlling in in that digitization of something that works in a therapeutic context. We're not, you know, there's that, there's the presence of a therapist or there's the, you know, the alliance that someone feels with them. There's all sorts of uh, factors that are different. Um, And so, a different approach and one that um, we're taking uh, is really to look at the underlying reason why some of those treatments are effective and then develop new techniques in the digital space that are kind of designed natively for that digital environment that are really ecologically valid in that digital context rather than trying to digitize therapy, but, you know, invent a new digital uh, approach to therapy, if that makes sense. It's 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 basically taking the underlying principle of what's working in a therapeutic context and trying to implement that um, in a way that makes sense in the digital environment rather than just to digitize what's working. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that because one of the things that we grapple with, um, certainly with the support services at the university, with that notion that, well, all the students are online and everyone loves um, apps, so that's that's what we should do. Um, and as you say, it's it's way more complex, but also for us, even that notion of well, what what brings someone back to an app day after day. Um, and it could be pop ups, it could be messages. And um, but I, I I really appreciate that framing around what we think can work in person. Um, we assume will then just simply translate. But I think there's an awful lot of research and understanding, um, particularly sort of, you know, with um, really credible mental health professionals saying you would think so, but actually not. Yeah, I work I work with people all over the world on this particular problem um, in the sense that they've they've come to me because they wanted to know how to basically harness the motivational pull that games have and bring it into these other contexts. But the, what I hear from people is is uh, and what I read in the in their in their publications is is basically exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about, that those things that are working that kind there's all this sort of like external like kind of extrinsic uh factors that are that are guiding people to return to a therapeutic context for example or to focus in that moment and to actually do the reflection or the the you know the work that the 
counselor is asking them to do. But when they're doing that in an app context, they could be, you know, surrounded by their children. They could be taking a two minute break while they're waiting for the water to boil while they're making supper. They could be, you know, we don't have control over their context. And so that's mis- that's completely missing. But the idea of, um, of volition is really important here. And so they have to be engaging with the app um, because they want to make a change. And how do we use digital technology to better facilitate that um, than we are right now, which is basically download an app and, and hope that somebody actually does the work of using it. I think that's particularly true for people who, who say, well, they, they, you know, they want to see a counsellor, but actually with the, the critical piece is actually that readiness for change. Yeah. Um, which, you know, we, we tend to assume but um, but that that often does take some time. So simply because you download an app is an indication that that you need something. But actually, the the readiness to do the work and to c- commit to those things is the critical piece. I, I totally agree with that. And it's an interesting study that was looking at Headspace, which is a a meditation app, and they found that the value of it was actually in the download of it. So it was just as okay. valuable for you to have it downloaded on your on your phone as it was for you to use it. And I think that it's really probably, and, and they couldn't figure out why this was happening, but I, I think it's a it's really maybe just an indication of that readiness. If I'm actually willing to do the work of looking for what might be the best, you know, meditation app out there, you know, deciding which one to download, downloading it, that that actually puts me in a position where I'm, where it's an indicator that I'm ready to make a change. Um, and that is a really, it's a, a fundamental and an important piece um, that's kind of sometimes missing from a lot of, a lot of the app work that's done out there. Well, and, and there's no stigma in downloading an app. Mm. Not yet, not yet anyway. Yeah, no discrimination. Yeah. So I'm asking all uh, my guests to share one thing they're doing to be well right now, perhaps something that brings them joy or a sense of connection. What, what would that thing mm. be for you and, and how are you finding it's helping? Honestly, I, I'm on the sourdough bandwagon, so I'm <laughs> I'm baking a lot of bread. Um, I've always I've always really been like a work hard, play hard, rest hard kind of person. I've been really bad at relaxing my whole life. It's something that I've been working on for the last decade. Uh, I'm and uh, you know the people that are close to me know that I'm really bad at it. Our family tends to go on ski trips uh, because it is really the only way that we figured out to turn off our brains is to, you know, punish our bodies <laughs> it's, it's in such a way that we actually can't think. We can't ruminate. We can't, you know, have this perseverative cognition. We actually are just focused on the moment and getting down that hill without, you know, breaking any limbs. So I'm, I'm really bad at that. But And I'm also used to traveling about a quarter of the time. I spend about a quarter of my time on the go. Um, now I'm in an open plan house with three other humans and I'm, I'm not really at a loss for social connection. Uh, so I do get actually get a lot of restorative value from being alone in my kitchen, listening to music or podcasts and just baking away. And if my family comes in, I just suggest that they help by doing dishes. And that usually buys me a little more time by myself. But <laughs> that, is a very, that is a very clever strategy. Set, <laughs> set, set them a task and they abandon ship quickly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, so I am doing a lot of that. But I also am um, trying to find ways to connect to the my closest um, friends who, because of my travels, are not always here. Um, most of my closest friends are like eight time zones away. And so I connect with them uh often asynchronously over text, but I also try and find time to actually chat with people and sometimes even also by playing games with them. <laughs> and there it is. So is there a final thought that you'd want to leave listeners with either about the work that you do or, or how we find ourselves in the world at the moment? Yeah, I, I guess um, I guess what I want listeners to take away is that we shouldn't be afraid of games or really dismiss them as toys. They're not really the socially isolating experiences that some people claim them to be. They can be used to build new relationships, maintain existing ones, and they offer new opportunities for helping people feel connected to one another. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a time right now where people are stuck in their homes and, and from kids through, you know, grown adults, we're not able to do the kinds of social activities that we're used to doing. Our sports teams are on pause. There's no book clubs um, in person. We're not getting together with friends to go to see a show or just to have dinner or a drink at the bar. Um, and so games do provide an opportunity, you know, there is, there is a generation of, of golf buddies or bowling buddies who play together and, and maybe now they're clan members or guilds or part of a raiding party. Um, and so rather than worrying about it, maybe we can try and harness gaming's benefits, the benefits that we see for restoring mood, recovering from stress and mostly connecting with others. 
Well, look, I really, really appreciate the conversation today. You've actually made me think quite hard about the role that I have with my own children and how much interest and knowledge that I actually should should gain about this, uh, you know, their lives, um, you know, in many ways. Well, um, and I also know there's lots of interest in your research. Uh, I think it's really incredible and important research that you're doing. So I appreciate that you spending the time with me today and sharing those thoughts. Oh, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Be Well at USAS podcast with me, Peter Headley. And thanks again to Regan for joining me and sharing. You can find out more about Regan's work in the links in the podcast details. Please check in again for further episodes and more content related to being well. Please subscribe and share this podcast. You can find us on multiple platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We'd also love to hear from you. Please post comments and questions, and we'll look to include them in future episodes. Also, if there's someone you'd like to see as a guest or a topic you'd like us to cover, or even a reaction to an episode you want to share, please write to us at bewell.podcast at usask.ca. In the next episode, I'm going to be talking to Heaven Berhe, the president of the African Students Association at the university. We're going to be talking about racism and how we can have uncomfortable and important conversations in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. So until next time, stay safe and be well.